In the name of God the Gracious, the Merciful, all praises to God and peace be upon His servants whom He chose. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today's topic is about the Salah according to the Quran. According to traditional Islamic ideology, the Salah is a ritual prayer that is comprised of a specific sequence of recitations and a specific sequence of movements that are performed multiple times throughout the day. But the question is, does the Qur'an actually confirm this idea? Does the Qur'an teach that there is a ritual prayer called Salah? Let us find out. So the very first question we would ask ourselves is, where are the details of the ritual Salah in the Qur'an? Naturally, we would expect something of a comprehensive step-by-step -step, uh, list uh, or a sequence uh, as to how to observe or to perform the ritual Salah. But instead, we do not see that in the Qur'an. Instead, when it comes to the Salah, we see something entirely different in the Qur'an. But before delving into this, let us address some of the common claims said by those who say that the ritual Salah is actually in the Qur'an. The first common claim is that the ritual Salah is explained in the Hadith. And as Muslims, it is our duty to follow the Qur'an alone because the Qur'an is a book of guidance. It is complete. Nothing has been left out of it and it is fully detailed. In fact, in 18109, God says, Say, if the sea were an inkwell for the words of my Lord, then the sea would run out before the words of my Lord would run out, indicating that the Qur'an is all that we need for salvation. It is all that we need for details. God also says in 1689 that he has sent down the book as a clarification for all things. So if we do believe God, then that means that all the details that we need about Salah is mentioned in the Quran. So we can easily dismiss this very first claim. The second claim is that the ritual Salah has actually been passed down. And they justify this idea using 16.123, where it says, Then we inspire to you, you shall follow Millet of Abraham. And they say that the Millet here means that uh, it refers to the rituals, the Salah, Zakat, the Hajj, and fasting. They have all been established by Prophet Abraham and subsequently passed down to us from one generation to the next. According to this idea, this means that the Salah started at Abraham, to Moses, to Jesus, to Muhammad, until this very day, perfectly preserved approximately 4,000 years later. But there's a huge problem with this idea. We learn from Surah 2 verse 170, as well as many other verses in the Quran, that we are not allowed to follow our parents' religion blindly. And in Surah 3 verse 7, God says, You shall follow what has been sent down to you from your Lord, and do not follow besides him any supporters. This means that any rituals that have been passed down to us from one generation to the next, but cannot be verified in the scripture, that means it does. It is not from God. That means it does not belong in the system, the Deen of God. So let's address this idea of in sixteen one twenty three, where it talks about Millet Ibrahim. The word Milla in Arabic comes from the root word Ma La La or Milla, and it means to dictate. That's all that the word means. So God is saying, then we inspire to you, you shall follow the creed, the dictation of Abraham, which is, in the very next word, monotheism. This is all that the, 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 the dictation of Abraham is, which is monotheism. It has nothing to do with rituals. So the idea or the notion of the rituals having passed down from since the time of Prophet Abraham uh, using the word Millah is incorrect, Quranically speaking, and therefore we can automatically and easily dismiss this second claim. The third claim is quite interesting because according to one website that I have visited, the ritual Salah is actually spelled out in the Quran. So what I have done is I have listed all 114 chapters of the Quran so that we can get a visual perspective as to what this article claims. According to this article, in Surah 29, the purpose of Salah is spelled out. And in Surah 20, we are to remember God during Salah. And in Surah 5, the ablution for Salah is mentioned. And in Surah 2, the direction for the Salah is mentioned. But note that the red arrow, any red arrows that you see here, means that the word Salah does not actually appear in the verse. And in the same Surah, but later on, God tells us how to begin the Salah. And in Surah 4, God tells us 
to stand and prostrate during Salah, but the word bowing does not occur. Instead, in Surah 22, the word bowing occurs, but the word Salah does not. In Surah 18, we are to recite from the Qur'an during Salah. And in Surah 17, we are to use a moderate tone during Salah. But in 56, the glorification during the bowing position is mentioned, but the word Salah does not occur here. In Surah 87, the glorification during prostration is mentioned, but the word Salah does not occur here. And in Surah 3, the Shahada is mentioned, but not associated with the word Salah. And in Surah 10, the ending of Salah, but again, the word Salah does not occur here. And in Surah 62, the Friday Salah is mentioned. In Surah 11, the number of Salah is mentioned. In Surah 17, also the number of Salah is mentioned. And in Surah 24, the Salah names. This is according to one website that I have that says that the ritual Salah is actually mentioned in the Qur'an. I hope you see what the problem is here. The problem is God is giving us a jumbled mess as far as our ritual Salah is concerned. Let me ask here, if the ritual Salah is such an important topic, why is God giving it to us in such a jumbled mess where we have to kind of puzzle piece everything together to try to figure out what the ritual Salah is. My conclusion to this is that the only way anyone could observe a ritual Salah such as the one that you see here in the top right corner is through a confirmation bias. There is no other way anyone could gather a ritual Salah from this. If you had no idea what, a, what the Salah was and you opened the Quran, there's no way you can gather from the verses, these jumbled messed verses, uh, a ritual in any way, shape, or form. So to me, this common claim can also be dismissed. So now that we have addressed the common claims of the ritual Salah in the Qur'an, let's delve into this topic. But before doing so, let me remind everyone, including myself, of Surah 7 verse 204, where God says, al -Quran wa turhamun. And if the Qur'an is being read, then listen to it, and be silent that you may receive mercy. God says, Ansitu, be silent, referring to your internal dialogue, all your preconceived notions, everything, all your judgments inside of your mind needs to be silenced. In other words, remove your preconceived notions of what you understand about Salah as if you are listening to it for the very first time. This is the way we can receive the mercy, God willing. So let's start by first defining the word Salah. It comes from the root word Sa'd Lam Wow and it means following closely. In the Arabic language during a horse race, the first horse is called Sabiq or the leader, whereas the second horse is called Al Musalli because it is following closely to the first horse. This definition is actually confirmed in Surah 75 verse 31 where it says فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى For he did not speak the truth nor salla, but instead he lied and turned away. We see that the opposite of truth is lying, whereas the opposite of salla is to turn away. If the opposite of salla is to turn away, then this means salla means to turn towards and to follow closely. And we can also see in Surah 87 verse 15 the criteria for Salah. It says, وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ fasalla, And he remembered the name of his Lord, therefore he followed closely. He Salah. So by, mean, by remembering God, we are following closely. So now that we understand what Salah or Salah means, following closely let's look in the Quran as to what is a person what does it mean for a person to observe salah the definition qualities and characteristics of one who observes salah is found in surah 70 verse 22 to 34 and god begins the passage by saying except for those who follow closely al musallin this means that whatever is going to precede this verse is going to be the qualities and characteristics of one who observes the salah god then says those are the ones who are constant and they're following closely
Note the word constant here. In Arabic, it is da'imun. Da'imun signifies something that is unending and uninterrupted. It is constant. This is the very opposite of a ritual salah, because in, in a ritual salah, you observe it for a few minutes, and then it stops. It is interrupted. Whereas the Quranic salah, it means that you are in a constant state of salah. It does not interrupt. And then God describes or gives us the characteristics and qualities of a musalli. And I listed it out for us here on the left side. A musalli is one who gives to charity. They believe in the day of judgment. They are fearful of God. They guard their chastity. They are trustworthy. They are truthful in their testimony. And they guard their salah. What do these qualities have in common? And the answer is that these are all commandments from the Qur'an. They are godly commandments. So of one who follows closely is simply following the commandments of the Qur'an. And this is all that Salah means. Following closely to the laws of God. A Musalli is one who follows closely to God's laws. And really folks, this is all that we need to know about Salah. To uphold the Salah means you are following closely to God's laws, as clearly spelled out in this passage. Now that we understand what Salah means, following closely to God's laws, let's put this into perspective and use some verses from the Qur'an to gain a better understanding. Let's begin with Surah 29 verse 45, where it says, Recite what is inspired to you of the book and uphold the following closely. For the following closely prohibits immorality and vice. So the quality of upholding the following closely, it prohibits immorality and vice. It is not the ritual salah that's going to prohibit us from immorality and vice. It is by following closely to God's laws, we can prohibit ourselves from immorality and vice. We also see in Surah 107, where God says, have you seen the one who is denying in the system, the one who mistreats the orphans, who the one who does not encourage the feeding of the poor? So woe to those who are following closely. They are the ones who are heedless of their following closely. They only want to be seen and they withhold from any assistance. So we see here that the following closely are those, the, the ones who are heedless of their salah, of their following closely, is not about the ritual salah. It is simply about denying the system, mistreating the orphans, and not encouraging the feeding of the poor. It is the opposite of following God's laws. They are heedless of following God's laws. Let's look at Surah 19, uh, verse 59 through 60. Then generations came after them who lost the following closely and followed their own desires. They will find their consequences. So, it's not that they lost the ritual salah. They have lost the following closely to God's laws. They 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 forgot about God's laws. They left it alone and instead followed their own desires. And then in the next verse, God says, "Except for those who whoever repents and believes and does good works." So the criteria of following God's laws closely is for those who whoever repent and believe and does good works. Let's try another set of verses. Surah 2, verse 44 through 45. Do you order the people to do good but forget yourselves while you are reciting the book and seek help through patience and the following closely? Here God is simply telling the people, do you, for, do you order the people to do good but forget yourselves while you are reciting the book? You are reciting the laws and seek help through the patience and following closely to God's laws. Surah 4 verse 77. Did you not see the, those who were told, seize your hands and uphold the following closely? But when fighting was decreed for them, a group of them were concerned towards the people as they would have been concerned towards God or even more so. And they said, our Lord, why did you decree for us fighting? Again, we see key words here to decree. So God commanded them to do certain things, but they, uh, they were, and they were told to uphold the salad, uphold the following closely to whatever has been decreed for them. And then we see in Surah Surah 11, verse 84 through 87, it talks about Shu'ayb, 
Shaib says, My people serve God. You have no other God beside him. Do not give short in the measure and the weight. And my people give full in the measure and the weight equitably and do not hold back from the people what, uh, what is theirs and do not roam the land corrupting. They said, O Shuaib, does your following closely order you that we leave what our fathers served and what, or that we do not do with our money as we please? So Shuaib gave them commandments, divine commandments, and then the people responded and says, Does your salatuka, does your following closely order you that we leave? It's not talking about a ritual salat, it is simply talking about divine laws that he was adhering to. And the last set of verses, 42-38, And those who have responded to their Lord, and they uphold the following closely, and their affairs are conducted by mutual consultation among themselves, and from our provisions to them they give. It is very apparent here that those who have responded to their Lord, and they uphold the following closely, they uphold by following closely to God's laws. 591, The devil wants to cause strife between you and to repel you away from remembering God and from following closely to the God's laws. Again, these verses are not talking about some rituals. They are talking about following closely to God's laws. Surah 9 verse 5. So when the restricted months have passed, then you may kill the polytheists wherever you find them. If they repent and they uphold the following closely and they contribute towards the betterment, then you shall leave them alone. This verse is not referring to the polytheists observing the ritual salat. It is simply referring to the polytheists observing, respecting, following what has been decreed or laid out in the Qur'an. So again, folks, we, we have just seen nine verses from the Qur'an and how the word salah is being used with the understanding that salah means following God's laws closely. It does not refer to rituals. So to briefly summarize, a musalli is one who follows closely to God's laws. And if we are to use the analogy of the two horses, the Qur'an would actually be the leader in the situation, whereas the believer, the Muslim that is adhering to the Qur'anic laws would be following closely. He would be the musalli. This means that as long as this believer is not violating the Qur'anic commandments, he or she is following closely to the Qur'an. He or she is a musalli. Now, of course, we're going to have other questions about other verses because the word salah has been used in a particular manner. Let's address them. There are two verses in the Qur'an that command the believer to uphold the salah at specific times of the day. These are 11114 and 1778. Interestingly, both of these verses begin with the word aqim in the singular form, meaning that it is addressing the messenger initially. So the question is, why was, is God telling the messenger to uphold the salah at these specific times? We know from the Quran that the duty of the messenger is to deliver the message to the people. And this was done at these mentioned specific times. According to the Qur'an, these were called Salah as well. But for the sake of this video, for the sake of clarity, I'm going to call them Salah sessions. So, according to the Qur'an, Salah sessions is when the messenger would, would meet with the people at these specific times so that he can recite the Qur'an onto them and thus they have the opportunity to follow God's laws closely. This is why it was called Salah. Now, the evidence for uh, this type of Salah, these Salah sessions, are actually found within the verses themselves, within the context of each of these verses. So let's talk about both of these verses, as well additional few, uh, a couple of additional uh, verses that also talk about Salah sessions. Let's address verse, uh, Surah 11, verse 114, taking it into context, starting at verse 110. Where it says, and we gave Moses the book. God is talking about the book of Moses 
how they disputed in it, and had it not been for a word which was already given by your Lord, their, their case would have been judged immediately. They are in grave doubt concerning it. They are talking about the Qur'an, how the people are doubting the revelation of the Qur'an. Then God tells the messengers, So stand firm as you were commanded, and those who have repented with you, and do not transgress, he is seer over what you do, and uphold the salah, uphold the following closely, at both ends of the day, in nearness from the night, the good deeds take away the bad deeds, this as a reminder for those who remember. So based on the context, there was the duty of the messenger to deliver the message to the people, and God was telling to stand firm, even though they are they have doubts concerning the Quran, he is to stand firm with the commandments and still deliver that message at these specific mentioned times. The same principle applies to Surah 17 verse 78 in context starting from verse 73. And they nearly diverted you from what we inspired to you so that you would fabricate something different against us and then they would have taken you as a friend. Note how the passage is talking about the revelation of the Quran. The next verse, and if we had not made you stand firm, you were about to lean towards them a little bit. Uphold the following closely at the declining of the sun to the darkness of night and Quran at dawn. The Quran at dawn is witnessed. And we send down from the Quran what is a healing and mercy to the believers. Note how it is all revolving around the idea or the notion of the Quran being revealed. So God is telling the messenger, uphold these Salah sessions at these specific times despite what people are trying to do uh, to you and uh, trying to divert you from what was inspired to you. In the same surah, towards the end, we see the same thing being talked about, about the Salah sessions, starting from verse 105. And it is with the truth that we have sent it down, and with the truth it came down, and we have not sent you except as a bearer of good news and a warner, and a Qur'an that we have separated so that you may read it to the people over time, and we have brought it down gradually. See how it's talking about the revelation, how it's being brought down, and then say believe in it or do not believe in it those who have been given the knowledge before it when it is recited to them they fall to their chins in humility say call on god or call on the almighty by whichever call on to him are the best names and do not be too loud in your salatika nor too quiet but seek a path in between so the salatika or salatika here you're following closely is in regards to the salah sessions and as we can see as a passage the context shows is talking about the recitation of sending down the Quranic revelation to the people. And we also see the same thing in Surah 4 in verse 103 and 105. Indeed, the Salah, the following closely for the believers, is a book that is scheduled. Kitaban Mawquta. So it is a book. It's in regards to the revelation bring uh, revelation of the Quran. Next verse, and we have revealed to you the book with the truth that you may judge between the people that which God has shown you. So as we can see, there are things called Salah sessions in which the messenger would meet with the people at specific times to deliver the message to them. And thus it was an opportunity for them to follow God's laws closely. According to the Qur'an, the Salah sessions were done twice a day, evening and dawn. And we can see this in Surah 11 verse 114 where it says, Uphold the following closely at both ends of the day and the nearness from the night. And in 1778, it says, Uphold the Salah at the declining of the sun to the darkness of night and Qur'an at dawn. Note, both of these verses confirm to each other, they explain each other. So they are talking about the dawn and evening time sessions. And this is where, and to get a visual perspective, look at the left side here. We see that both, both ends of the day is over here. And then the nearness from the night. The nearness from the night are the dawn and the evening. And in 1778, we see the declining of the sun until the darkness of night, the evening time, and Quran at dawn. So these are two sessions that were, that were done during the daytime, the evening and dawn. And this is confirmed in 2458, where God specifically mentions the names of these Salah, as Salatul Fajr, which is dawn, and Salatul Isha, which is evening.
Additionally, the Quranic criteria to attend these Salah sessions for the believers is that they must be clean and clear-minded. And this is where the idea of ablution comes from. Where God in Surah 5 verse 6 says, O you believe, if you get up to the following closely, then you shall wash your faces and wipe your heads and so on and so forth. And God wants to cleanse you to complete his blessings upon you. So in order, in order to represent yourself, you must be clean when attending these Salah sessions. Additionally, in Surah 4 verse 43, it talks about do not not coming near the Salah while you are intoxicated. So you must be clear-minded. You must be able to know what you are saying during the Salah sessions. These Salah sessions, in addition to conveying the message to, to the people, the Salah sessions were comprised of Quranic recitation, supplication, glorification, invitation, basically anything that brings you closer to God. And we can see a few examples of these throughout the Quran, like in Surah 29 verse 45, where it says, Recite what is inspired to you of the book and uphold the Salah, for the Salah prohibits immorality and vice, but certainly the remembrance of God is the greatest. So in these Salah sessions, the greatest objective is remembrance of God. In Surah 3, verse 38 through 39, we see Zechariah imploring his Lord while he was observing the Salah, the Salah sessions, meaning that he was imploring God uh, some form of supplication uh, during the Salah sessions. And in 17.110, we see how the Prophet invited the people to the path of God. So the Salah sessions, the idea behind it is simply to remember God through Quranic recitation, supplication, glorification, and invitation. Now some have said that the Salah sessions were done during the Messenger's time because the people did not have the Quran with them. But now that we have the Quran with us, we no longer need to observe these Salah sessions. I completely disagree with this idea. In fact, my understanding from the Quran is that all believers must observe the Salah sessions even after the death of the Messenger. Yes, in 11.114 it says uphold the following closely in a singular form, and in 17.78 it says uphold the following closely also in a singular form, meaning that it's addressing the Messenger. But there are verses in the Quran that that address all believers. Like in 2458, where God talks about the privacy times involving revolving around Salatul Fajr and Salatul Isha. And it, and it begins with the phrase, O oh, you who believe. Since we are all believers, then this ad verse address is addressing us. Likewise in Surah 5 verse 6, where it says, O oh, you who believe, if you get up to the Salah, then you shall wash your faces. Also addressing all the believers. And in Surah 4 verse 43 and 101, also addressing all the believers. So we cannot say that God it does not want the believers to observe the Salah because clearly God is telling all the believers to observe these Salah sessions. And in addition to 11, 114 and 1778, where it's addressing the messenger in a singular form, understand that if God were to use the word prophet, then I would agree that that means that only the prophet during his time when he was alive, he was to uphold these Salah sessions. But because God is addressing in the singular form, it all equally applies to any reader reading the Qur'an. So, as far as I can understand from the Qur'an, these Salah sessions must be observed by all believers. So to conclude, Upholding the Salah, Quranically speaking, is to follow God's laws closely and it is to observe these Salah sessions that are mentioned in the Quran. And this is all that Salah means according to the Quran. Another thing that is noteworthy to mention is that the word Salah in the Qur'an is actually a general term because there are different types of Salah. What we have seen so far is the Salah from human to God and we can see this for example in Surah 87 verse 15 where it says, And he remembered the name of his Lord and thus he followed closely. So this is a Salah that's from human to God. Additionally, like in Surah 9 verse 5 
where it talks about the polytheists upholding the Salah. And this does not mean that they are to observe a ritual prayer or to become Muslims, but simply based on the context, it indicates that the polytheists who were violating the peace treaty, they were supposed to, to uphold the Salah in the sense of abiding by the laws or the rules that are laid out in the Qur'an. Another type of salah is the salah that's from God to the human being. And we can see this in Surah 33 verse 56 where it says, Inna Allahu wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi God and his angels follow closely onto the Prophet. And all that this means, it indicates that God and the angels are supporting the Prophet. And the third type of salah is from the human to human. And we can see this in the second part of the phrase where it says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O you who believe, you shall follow closely onto him, indicating that there is a salah between the human beings. All these indicate that there is a support, some type of support that is from God to the human as well as from human to human. So what all of this indicates is that the word Salah is actually an umbrella term, meaning that based on the context that we are reading, the different types of Salah can be applied. And we can see this in Surah 2 verse 238, where God says, Hafidu ala as salawat guard the following closely, salawat in the plural form. Salawat here is plural, meaning three or more. And then God says, was salatul wusta wa qumu lillahi qanitin, and the following closely, salah in the singular form, that is the most balanced. The reason why God is using the word salawat in the plural form in the first part is not because of the, the ritual prayers, but simply referring to the three or more different types of salah in the Quran. God wants us to guard these different types of salah. And then he wants us to be balanced with these salahs. The word wusta in Arabic means balanced. Some have said it means the middle, which is which is also applicable. However, wusta in the Quran indicates something that is fair, balanced, or just, like in Surah 5 verse 89 and 68 28. So now I'd like to talk about the, the notion of the three different movements that we are supposed to do in the Salah, standing, bowing, prostration, or qawama, raka'a, sajada. As noted earlier, there is no instruction on how to observe a ritual Salah in the Qur'an. The words qawama, raka'a, sajada are never found together with the term Salah, and all three of these terms are scattered throughout the Qur'an. So in other words, we do not find any form of instruction or methodology on how to observe the ritual prayer that we know of today. Instead, we do see these three terms scattered throughout the Qur'an, but not in a coherent fashion in the sense of a ritual. So let's address each of these terms so that we can get clarity as to what is God talking about in regards to these terms. So let's begin with the root word qawama, where words like aqim comes from. Qawama, based on the root definition, means to set something aright and maintaining it. There is no doubt that in the Arabic language, qawama can mean to stand up, like in Surah 3 verse 191, but it could also mean to set something aright like a wall, like in 1877. And it could also signify keeping after someone or something, like in 375. But when it comes to the salah, aqimu as salah simply means to uphold the salah. We are setting the salah aright and maintaining it. It is just like the phrase aqimu ad din, uphold the din, uphold the system. It is just like the phrase aqamu at Torah, they upheld the Torah. And it also it also has the same significance as aqimu al wazna and uphold the weight. So uphold aqimu as salah simply means to uphold the salah because we are setting it aright and maintaining it. It has nothing to do with standing up. So when we look at this and reflect on Surah 3 verse 38 through 39, people, a lot of people are using this uh, passage to say, see, Zechariah was actually standing up during his Salah. It's possible that he was standing up, but it could also mean that he was simply upholding the prayer that is mentioned here. In verse 38, it says, it was then that Zechariah implored his Lord. He said, my Lord, grant me from you 
a good progeny, you are the hearer of prayer. So the angels called him while he was upholding, following closely. He was upholding the prayer that he was talking, that he was saying in the previous verse. This is all that aqamu or aqim, aqaimun means. So upholding aqim simply means to uphold something. The next term we'd like to look at is raka'a, where words like irka'u comes from. Raka'a, uh, based on its root definition, means to be non-resistant and yielding. This is why in Lisan al-Arab it says the man has raka'a if he becomes poor after being rich and his situation worsens. So the man who was rich then becomes poor, goes through raka'a, he becomes non-resistant and yielding to his poor situation. Even a ground that gives and there's a hole in the ground, it's called raka'a because the ground itself became non-resistant and yielding. In Surah 5, verse 55, it talks about the believers, how they uphold the Salah and give the Zakah while they are raki'un, while they are yielding. It doesn't make sense that they are upholding the Salah and giving the Zakah while they are bowing. It simply doesn't make sense from a ritual uh, Salah perspective. It, it, it refers to being yielding to the situation. They uphold the Salah, give the Zakah while they are yielding. And this is why in Surah 3, verse 42 through 43, God is talking to Mary. He says, O Mary, God has selected you and cleansed you, and he has selected you over all the women of the worlds. O Mary, be dutiful to your Lord and submit and yield with those who are yielding. It doesn't make sense that Mary is to just to simply bow. It's referring to Mary yielding to the said information about her. God has selected you and cleansed you. So she has to yield to these commandments. This is all that raka'ah means from a Quranic perspective. And of course, the last term, sajada, where words like usjudu comes from. Sajada, based on the root definition, means to obey and submit to the commandments given. Lisan al-Arab confers this. It says, anyone who humbles and submits to what he was commanded to do, then he has sajada. And we can see this in the Quran in 16, 48 through 50. It says, Have they not seen what God has created of a thing? Its shadows incline to the right and left in submission to God, and they are humbled. So God talks about how the shadow submits or, or does sujood to God. And then it says, And to God, yes, judu submits all those in the heavens and all those on earth from the creatures and the angels, and they are not arrogant. They fear their Lord from above them, and they do what they are commanded to do. So, based on the past, this passage, sujud simply means obeying what you are commanded to do. That is all that sujud means. And we can put this into perspective. Like in 96.19, it says, No, do not obey him. Submit and come near. In Surah 7, verse 161 through 162, it says, Reside in this town and eat from it as you please and enter the gate submitting. So jadan. It, it does not mean in prostration. It simply means in submission. In 2564, those who dwell for their Lord in submission. So jadan and staying up. In 84, 21 through 22, and when the Quran is read over them, they do not submit. Yes, judun. One can, if they want to, put prostration here, but there is no significance to prostrating here. Instead, it is the submission that signifies you obeying the commandments given. Another key point to keep in mind is that sujood in the Quran cannot refer to physical prostration if we read these verses carefully. Like in 234, it says, Submit to Adam. Usjudu li. Adam. It doesn't say submit towards Adam or usjudu ila Adam. If God was referring to a physical prostration, he would have said usjudu ila Adam. Ila means towards Adam. But it says submit to Adam, li Adam. The same applies in 726. And to him they submit. Walahu yasjudun. Yasjuduna lishams. Submitting to the sun, not towards the sun. I saw them submitting to me. Ra'aytahum li sajideen. Will they not submit to God? Allah yasjudu lillah. So it's not towards God, it's to God. So the idea of sujood 
having anything to do with prostration that has holds no water in the Quran. Instead, sujood in the Quran simply means to submit to the commandments as given in Surah 16, verse 48 through 50. So now that we understand what salah is from the Quran, as well as what raka'ah, sajada, and qawama mean, let's begin addressing the often quoted verses where the word salah is used, as well as qawama, raka'ah, or sajada. Let's begin with Surah 2, verse 124 and 125, where it talks about Abraham and how he was tested by words from his Lord, and he fulfilled them. He said, I will make you a leader for the people. So God wanted to, wanted to make Abraham an exemplary leader for the people. And then Abraham said, uh, and also for my progeny, he said, my, my pleasure will not encompass the wicked. And we have made the sanctuary to be a return refuge for the people. So Abraham was to build this sanctuary as a safe refuge for the people. And then it says, and you shall take from the status of Abraham a place for following closely. Note here the word maqam in Arabic. Maqam unfortunately has been uh, misunderstood, mistranslated, and abused as to signify somewhere where Abraham actually physically stood, supposedly. This is a place where Abraham supposedly stood in Mecca. Those are his footprints, supposedly, and that's where people actually observe the ritual prayer. Again, this is incorrect. Maqam in the Quran signifies a status, not a physical place in which you stand. You can refer to these verses to, to verify this. So God is saying, you shall take from the status of Abraham a place for following closely, Musalla. The word Musalla here is not a ritual prayer. You can see this in 1437 where it also talks about the Musalla of Abraham. The Musalla of Abraham is we are to take from his status a following closely, devotion, reverence, leading a life dedicated to God alone. And then it says, and we covenant unto Abraham and Ishmael, you shall purify my sanctuary for those who visit those who are staying and the yielding and the submitting they are yielding and submitting they're not they're not bowing and prostrating they're yielding and submitting to the following closely to the laws that are laid out for them the sanctuary is welcomed by travelers anyone staying and those who are yield and submit to the rules of god this is all that this passage is talking about it's not talking about some ritual prayer uh, where you're supposed to try to uh, uh, bow and prostrate to where Abraham once stood, it doesn't make sense from the Quran. It's simply talking about the sanctuary that Abraham built, and it's devoted to God alone, and it is for those who yield and submit to the rules of God. The next verse we'd like to look at is Surah 48, verse 29, where it says, Muhammad is the messenger of God, and those who are with him are severe against the disbelievers, but merciful between themselves. You see them yielding, submitting. They seek the blessings and approval of God. Let me ask here, is bowing and prostrating going to give you, going to be a benefit to seek the blessings and approval of God? The answer is no. It is by yielding and submitting to his rules that brings us the, the blessings and approval of God. Additionally, it says their distinction is in their faces as a result of submitting. And unfortunately, this phrase has been misused where people would actually bang their heads on the floor to try to get this distinction on their faces. This is not what God is saying. It says in their faces, not on their faces. So the distinction is in their faces, not on their faces, signifies that they are submitting to the rules of God. The result of sujood creates awe, reverence, and absolute submission in the face of the believers. This is all that the verses. The next verse is Surah 2, verse 238, where God says, Guard the following closely, salawat, and the following closely that is the most balanced, and maintain dutiful to God. We see here in the first part of the phrase, God says salawat in the plural form. And people say, oh, this is referring to the ritual prayers. This is incorrect. If we just simply read the passage in context, we see that in the previous passage, God is speaking of family, marriage, and divorce laws. And all that the salawat is referring to is that we are to follow these different types of rules laid out in that passage. Then God says, and the following closely that is the most balanced, as salatul wusta. The most balanced is to be fair, just, and equitable in the laws that are mentioned in this passage. 
that is all that this verse is mentioning. It's not referring to the ritual prayers or, or anything of that sort. It, it just seems very random for it to actually be speaking about it when it's in the midst of uh, family, marriage, and divorce laws. Instead, the Salah here is referring to following closely to the laws laid out for them. The next verse I would like to talk about is Suda 4 verse 102, where this is actually one of the most commonly quoted verses to justify the idea of a ritual salah. But if we read this verse very carefully, we will see that it defies the typical ritual salah that we know of today. Let's assume that the sajadu here is referring to prostration, and let's follow what it says exactly. In verse 102, it says, and if you are with them, the you here is singular, are with them, and you, still singular, uphold the Salah for them. Then let a group from among them stand with you, and let them bring their weapons. So put this into perspective. We have the leader of the group, and there is a group behind him bringing their weapons. Let a group from among them stand with you, and let them bring their weapons. And when they have such a do, they have such a do. It doesn't say when you all have done prostration it means when they have such a do they have done the prostration excluding the leader and let them be behind you the you here is plural what happened there's just sud the sudden shift of uh, the you from singular to you to plural and when they have such a do they have prostrated not including the messenger or the leader of the group so the whole this defies the typical ritual salah it does not include the leader of the group this is if we follow the actual wording of this verse. Instead, let me show you what I understand from this verse. So as noted earlier, this passage is talking about war. And more specifically, it's talking about how to uphold the Salah sessions during war. The word sajadu does not mean prostration. It means to submit to the rules given during the Salah sessions. And it says, let them be behind you. The Arabic word behind you is wara'akum. And it means to be in a situation or a position uh, where the other person cannot see you. And here I render it as covering you. And we can see an example of this in, in these verses. So let's put this into perspective again. And if you are with them and you uphold the salah for them, then let a group from among them stand with you and let them bring their weapons. So we have a group of soldiers here. And we have the leader in the center, for example. A group from among them will come to him with their weapons, hear the words of God. They will submit to them. Then they will leave and another group will come and listen and hear the words of God. When they have said to do submitted to the rules, then let them be behind you. Go into, back into the positions where they are covering the other persons. This is all that this verse is referring to. It's not talking about how to observe the ritual Salah, it is talking about how, how to uphold the Salah sessions during war. So the Salah sessions during war are done in a simple rotational manner. One group will come, listen to the message of God, submit, leave, and another group will come instead of them and do the same thing. And this is why in the next verse it says in 103, then if you are secure, then uphold the Salah Indeed, the, the Salah for the believers is a book that is scheduled. So the Salah sessions equals specific gatherings to listen and heed the messages of God. And if you read beyond this passage, 105-113, we will see this. And of course, last but not least is Surah 17, verse 107, where it says, Those who have been given the knowledge before it, when it is recited to them, they fall to their chins, submitting, sujadan. Note that in this phrase, the word Salah does not occur, so we can no way justify the idea or the notion that we are supposed to fall to our chins during Salah. Additionally, look at this phrase, they fall to their chins submitting. In Arabic, it says, يَخِرُّونَ لِلْأَذْقَانِ سُجَّدًا I have a few observations for this phrase. It says, they fall to their chins, not they fall onto their chins. And it also says, they fall to their chins, not they fall prostrating to their chins. And if sujood here is referring to physical prostration, then it would be redundant to say fall and prostrate in the same phrase. It would be redundant to say that because the prostration itself is the falling. God, it would have sufficed to say if, for example, it would have said they fall to their chins, that would have been enough. 
or they fall, they, they prostrate to their chins would have also been suffice. But instead, God says they fall to their chins submitting, sujedan. The word sujedan, if we pay attention in the next, uh, in, the, in, in 109, it says, and they fall to their chins, again, using the same expression, crying, and increases them in humility. So the part of the sujud here is that they fall to their chins crying and it increases them in humility. The sujud increases them in humility by submitting to what has been said or what is being recited onto them. They, it increases their humility. So this passage has nothing to do with physical prostration but simple submitting to the rules of God. So to sum up everything that we have learned, the idea or the notion of a salah being a ritual prayer cannot be found in the Qur'an. Instead, what we have learned is that the word salah means following closely. And according to the Qur'an, the salah is following God's laws closely, as well as upholding the salah sessions as ordained in the Qur'an. We also learned that the word raka'ah means yielding to the rules of God, and sajda means submitting to the rules of God. And this is all that salah means based on my research from the Qur'an and based on my understanding. It is also in my personal opinion that if a person chooses to do physical movements, then that is entirely up to them as a personal preference. But as far as the Qur'an is concerned, these physical movements have nothing to do with salah. Assalamu alaikum and inshallah see you next video.